me, I did a, um, as some of you might be aware, a paper for uh, what was the Journal of Public Deliberation at the time for Nicole, and she's asked me to present my research. I'm very flattered by the opportunity, so thank you very much. Um, before I do get into things, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians on the land on which I am currently located, which is the Turrbal and Yagara people here in Mianjin or Brisbane. Um, and I pay my respects to all elders, laws, customs and creation spirits, recognising that these have always been lands of meeting, collaboration and learning, although I suspect the traditional custodians didn't really envisage Zoom back in the day. Um, so there we go. So in terms of today's session, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of giving you the highlights of a few different papers, which is essentially kind of half of my PhD. Um, I very sort of sneakily kind of did two topics in my PhD and I hoped that nobody would notice at the marking end of things as I kind of went off in a different direction, not different direction, a related direction. Um, so I, um, you know, the second part is focused around the practitioner. So it's those sort of few papers. So I'll give you a little bit of context, of course, um, the existing literature I'll brush through quite quickly as many of you are familiar with it. Um, very short overview of my methodology and then I'll spend a bit of time on the findings and hopefully we've got a bit of time for discussion at the end. So by means of kind of um, orientation and, and I think I also need to sort of explain myself a little bit in terms of why I'm here and how I got here. So um, obviously in completing a PhD, I'm a bit of a researcher. Um, I am a practitioner by background, so um, having worked in local government and consultancy um, in engagement roles for the last probably 12, 13 years. Um, and then, of course, there's a bit of me that's just a little bit confused. I'm also going to note there that I'm a former teacher, which is kind of relevant because I sort of worked in the classrooms for sort of five or six years after doing my teacher training. And when I went into teaching, I had a very strong theoretical background plus a bit of practical experience and then most of it was kind of learned on the job. So in our first teaching we'd sort of have difficult children and we'd be going oh what's going on with this kid's behaviour but we had all the theory behind us going oh hang on Maslow's hierarchy of needs have you had breakfast you know so we could apply the theory to our practice and I thought that when I kind of made my way or fell backwards into my community engagement roles, I didn't have that background. So that was actually part of my um, motivation for doing the PhD, if you will, because and I think that a lot of practitioners miss that kind of, well, what is the theory behind this? What are we supposed to be doing? So that when they get into those little decisions, what's the right choice kind of ethically, theoretically, um, you know, purposefully. So that's kind of me in a nutshell. So the problem itself, of course, that I've tried to unpack through these different papers and through my research um, was that we've got a lot of legislation that requires different engagement. It's in all of the local government acts. I wrote a riveting paper that kind of compared what the requirements were. They're very kind of standard public submission, 28 day display kind of things, but moving to some of the more progressive stuff that we're seeing, particularly in Victoria. So there is a lot of, it's a massive driver for practice. Um, as you all know, some of the practitioners are quite resentful of this, that um, organisations are out to tick a box. Um, but there is a box there. So that's, you know, the pragmatist in there is like, well, they wouldn't be invited into a lot of these spaces if that kind of marker wasn't there. So of course, with lots of um, drivers, the practice is growing. Consequently, the practitioners are growing. And I believe um, that the practitioners are really, really important. So the number of roles that they play include things like designing, delivering, reporting on, evaluating. They're basically making a living or making a profit from these, you know, processes. So quite an important kind of group. And they're also a bit of a tricky group. If we look at some of the you know, professionalization literature, which was one of the rabbit holes that I kind of went down, um, professionals use typically, and this is a kind of widely accepted view, that professionals use their knowledge and skills to serve individuals or to serve the needs of a client or employer. And by doing that, they serve the greater good. But engagement professionals are a little bit different in that they're kind of serving the community as well as the institution simultaneously. And if they favor one over the other, then they kind of um, have the issue that they are running a sham process or that they're kind of working for the enemy. So it's a tricky sort of spot. Um, this is an argument that I developed in a paper that I wrote for research in ethical issues in organisations. This is my double into um, writing ethics. Turns out it's really hard and I'm not that good at it. So it was a pretty tricky paper to kind of get through. But I did, um, I did learn a lot. I did get to play in the kind of sociological literature around professionalisation. I found this stuff really interesting. Um, and it's kind of, uh, it's kind of gone through trends, you know, as you would expect. And it's been interesting because a lot of the kind of the way that the industry thinks that it's professionalizing is kind of stuck back on this trait list or checklist approach, this idea that 
once we have licensing, we're legit. Once we have this, we're legit. Once we have jurisdiction, we're legit. Once we have competencies and a degree or whatever, we're legit. So they're kind of playing in this space. There are kind of wider issues, um, particularly around kind of market closure and power. So these are the people that get to decide how the process is run. How come they get to decide and not, you know, somebody off the street and, and kind of what gives them the authority to have this legitimacy. So there's a number of themes that have kind of changed over time, but also a number that are still um, relevant to how the practice is professionalising um, and how practice is evolving as a bit of a, um, as a bit of an example. So I looked at Nordegraf who does some stuff in this space and he sort of talks about this idea of pure professionalism and all the sorts of things that need to be in place um, in terms of whether a, a practice is actually a profession as such. So I won't go through all of it because it's a bit tedious and we don't have time, um, but I thought it was a really kind of useful framework to make sense of things. Um, and I did a bit of an assessment as such in terms of of, you know, is, is this a profession, what we're talking about, what these practitioners do? Um, and I kind of came to the conclusion that on the kind of four case is that, look, there are common skills amongst practitioners. There is common experience. There is very much a shared service ethic to provide a public good. The practitioners have got very pure motivations um, in most instances. The, where it kind of falls down a little bit is, in, it's probably this one that I actually think is the most important, this lack of a cohesive and agreed upon body of knowledge. Like there are people that come from journalism, people that come from social sciences, people that come from public relations is they're kind of coming in and in terms of what is the body of knowledge is kind of up for regular debate or it's kind of avoided as a as a difficult conversation I actually think that's probably the linchpin there's another a few, there's a few other things that are kind of missing there are codes and standards but they're not used to control or regulate but maybe that's a good thing um, there's no discrete jurisdiction anybody can say yep I can do that sort of work um, and it's an interesting one. I, when I speak to practitioners, they say, look, if an engineer gives you blueprints of a plan and says, this is how we should build the bridge, everybody goes, oh, okay, well, I'm not an engineer, but that makes sense to me. Whereas um, when community engagement practitioners give an engagement strategy or an engagement plan to the organisation and say, this is what I think we should do, um, everyone's got an opinion because it's much more kind of open for debate and discussion. And I think we should do a workshop and why don't we do it online? And all of a sudden, um, there's no kind of expertise involved in the work. Um, and of course, there's no restrictions on how knowledge can be transferred and to whom there's no kind of gates at different points. But one again, um, once again, this might not be that important given the sort of subject area that we're talking about. So the verdict that I came to was that there's kind of some semblance um, of a profession, but not, you know, it's not a bit more than hairdressing, but not quite teaching kind of on a scale of, of sort of where things are at. Now, of course, um, there's a lot of other existing literature and some of these people have come and spoke and some of them you know they work quite intimately, so I, I won't labour the point. Um, but it is growing. There is more of a kind of um, growing field of work happening in the background, which is great. So, of course, um, Hendrix and Carson kicked a lot of this off originally. Bit of work from um, Graham Cooper and Emily Smith overseas and Caroline Lee, who you had on a few months ago, and I enjoyed very much listening to her seminar. Um, and her book was one of the ones that I sort of went through with um, lines and squiggles all over it. You know, when you decide to commit to ruining the book, um, that was one of those ones for me, which was really helpful. Um, and of course, there's been the work that's come out from the Ipsa Symposium and the work that followed after that. Um, I was lucky enough to meet Lawrence for her a couple of years ago in the UK and we hosted a panel at the International Conference on Public Policy in Montreal, which I think was last year. I don't know. I've really lost perception of time at the moment. Um, but as a result of that, um, her and I and um, Imrat Verhoeven in Denver, Holland, Holland um, are doing a special issue for local government studies. We're in the kind of uh, final throes of that at the moment. It should be out in the new year, but very much once again focused on facilitators, those that work inside organisations as well as um, community initiatives and how they're sort of um, facilitated as well. So that work is to come. Um, and of course, there's, you know, research and, and there's probably a lot more than this out there in terms of how influential practitioners can be on process. And it kind of ranges from aren't they wonderful through to watch out their kind of, you know, sneaky little buggers kind of thing. So there's a whole range out there. And I, I think the, the quote that I was most fascinated with was, of course, this one that facilitators are influenced by professional norms they learn through training and their direct experience as facilitators and this is the bit that I kind of wanted to explore you know what training is it that's influencing them what are they falling back on when they make these decisions um, in the design or in the room oops scroll too fast so um, 
the papers that I'll be kind of summarising from now on are based on a much larger kind of process, but essentially it was an explanatory mixed methods process um, taking from two big data sets. So the first data set was an online survey that was done in mid-2017. Um, it had 25 questions. It was open to anybody who identified as working in community engagement, um, which is pretty loose, but it's a pretty tricky kind of population to pin down as such. So it was kind of open slather, I guess. Um, we had 375 responses, which I was quite pleased with because I figured if the population of actual practitioners was around 15,000, that would give us a fairly substantial degree of confidence. But it's a very tricky space because some people might supervise people that do this work. They might double in it. I'm a land use planner. And yeah, I think I do community engagement because I ran a workshop once a year. So it's a bit, um, it's a bit sort of tricky to pin down. Uh, but it's a start, I guess, in, in kind of absence of there not being much else out there, part, of course, from the work of Carolyn Lee. Um, after the surveys were done and the analysis was done and I did a series of semi-structured interviews the following year, um, looking predominantly with senior practitioners, so wanting people that could reflect on changes that they had seen and also um, you know, for want of a better phrase, had been around the block a few times, particularly with the sorts of issues that are experienced, but it does um, of course, by taking that approach mean that I don't have a lot on the inexperienced or the new practitioners, which is actually an area of concern that I'll touch on a little bit later on. Um, so it was very much a mix of public and private. And I did aim for people that I knew would say different things from, you know, the other people that I'd spoken to to kind of get that level of saturation. So in terms of findings, um, and this is this kind of next, you know, 10 minutes or so is very much a summary of plus a little bit of extra bonus data of the um, article that was published late last year with Nicole's help. Um, so predominantly presenting some of those, uh, you know, demographic markers of who this population are. Um, and then exploring a little bit more about their views of what the practice looked like. So um, the demographics are, are, are kind of interesting. And when I presented this at the industry conference a couple of weeks ago, I got quite a few follow up emails and, you know, keen to kind of talk about some of these aspects a little bit more because they're very conscious of the need to be diverse as a, as a kind of um, as a population group. But essentially, the practitioner cohort looks a little bit like me. They're essentially sort of female early 40s, you know, and slightly overeducated. Um, which is kind of interesting and it's it, the practitioners had this sort of view that you know the practitioner body needs to be reflective of the community and I don't know if you kind of look at the politicians that that sort of need doesn't really exist as strongly there. So in terms of demographics essentially very very female um, which you know of course brings a whole nother layer of issues around it as to the work of women and the value and so forth as well if we want to take a more feminist angle. Um, so very, very female, very, very white. Um, so not a lot identifying with a cultural or ethnic group, sort of so assuming uh, kind of more mainstream uh, Australian. The little asterisks there represent that the fact that they would be underrepresented if compared with an Australian population. But keeping in mind, this is a group of 375. So basically, you know, this represents 10 or less in these bits, given that it's quite a small sample size. But I suspect, given what I've seen, it's, it's fairly kind of indicative anyway. It is a generally pretty white and a pretty European looking population. Um, okay, so female, white, predominantly employed, but there's also a number of kind of solo operators um, and small business people mixed in there as well. Predominantly local government employed, which wouldn't be surprising given the amount of kind of legislative requirements for local governments to do engagement of some degree. Um, other parts of my research that I did, we looked at how many practitioners were dedicated kind of engagement uh, practitioners were located in local governments and about half had somebody who did the engagement stuff and the other half didn't have anybody and it was a more kind of ad hoc approach. But my research at that time sort of said, look, we don't have anybody, but we're employing someone soon. So it kind of suggested that they were keen to be seen that, um, you know, we're playing in this space and we're employing people to do these sorts of roles, but very strong in local government, as you can see there, and smatterings um, from other sectors as well. So the kind of private solo consultants and state government um, that did tend to vary a little bit between states. 
So female, white, local government, pretty educated across the whole. So um, over half have got a bachelor's degree or above, um, whereas Australia wide, that's only 22% of the general population. So they're pretty well educated. They're also pretty over educated as well. So we ask them um, what qualification areas their kind of certificates and master's degrees and all the rest of it were in. And we've got a pretty decent spread. Um, that 2.7 was roughly how many qualifications each that they had. So doing bits of courses and all the rest of it here, I was quite surprised to find that kind of over a third had some sort of management qualification. Um, there's a general kind of business uh, background behind a lot of this. I wasn't terribly surprised um, to see that public relations, communication and media was sort of, you know, roughly a third there as well. There does tend to be a bit of tendency, particularly in state and even in local government organisations, that what was once a, maybe an engagement position has now become a communications and engagement officer. Um, so they kind of bundle those two roles up together, thinking that they're the most complementary on a regular basis. But typically, um, and this is very much my experience, not my research, comms tends to win out over engagement in terms of priorities because of the risks that are involved um, and also the knowledge that um, the practitioners in those roles bring with them. Community development is in there as well, social sciences, um, kind of social planning, community planning, social research, organisation development, but it is a pretty decent spread of, you know, the, the sorts of areas that people have either come from, doubled in or sort of have adjacent to their engagement work. Um, which is interesting because, you know, I wonder if a land use planner approaches engagement the same way a kind of public relations planned person does versus a kind of community development person does. So um, it's interesting to think about what their influence of their previous training and sort of theoretical frameworks would have over their practice. Now, these next few slides aren't in the paper. They're just questions that I asked in the survey that I probably hadn't thought through terribly well, but they're kind of interesting. Um, we asked them, what do you call somebody who works in community engagement? Do you have like, you know, is there a kind of collective sense of who they are as a practitioner cohort? Um, practitioner just won out, but some people call themselves facilitators. Some people consider themselves professionals and a small group consider themselves experts. So there's no kind of agreed upon term, no sort of general consensus there. Likewise, we asked them, um, how would you describe community engagement? The, the term kind of a community of practice has been thrown around for a number of years and it's relatively popular. Some people call it a discipline, a profession, a field, a sector, a movement, an industry. So, you know, in terms of who we are, what we call ourselves and what it is we do and what we belong to, um, there's a number of different kind of angles that are taken. And likewise, um, do you think community engagement is viewed as a profession outside community engagement circles? And there's a general kind of agreement of no, but those that said yes often said things like, well, you know, there's positions, there's policies, there's I'm being employed to do these programs, so it must be, um, versus uh, people don't really understand what it is and what we do. We're more the kind of arguments behind the no when, when sort of asked. So um, in terms of, and this is kind of starting to draw more from the qualitative findings in terms of what informs practitioners practice, a bit of a mouthful, um, previous work experience, study and training kind of factored in there. So some people said, oh, you know, I have a social work background or a policy background or community development record. I draw really heavily on that in my engagement practice. Um, other people did say things like, oh, look, I did engineering and I haven't used any of it. It was a total waste of time. So <laughs> um, they seem to think they didn't bring anything with them because it's not directly the same, but I suspect they probably bought a few kind of ways of thinking or some habits with them, but I didn't have time to um, explore that in this research. Quite a lot of people spoke about how much they learnt on the job, um, including how many mistakes they made and how that kind of helped them to sort of not make them in the future. Um, there was lots of mention of different trainings and short courses that people do, everything from kind of IAP2 to collective impact courses to, you know, one day forums on um, art of hosting and circle work and all sorts of bits and pieces. Um, and in terms of the formal qualifications, they were a bit divided as to whether they were useful or not useful. Um, individual traits came up, was sort of mentioned in terms of this is what informs my practice. They spoke um, quite a bit actually about how as a cohort, as a kind of uh, practice body that they are comfortable with ambiguity. They, they seem to, whether it's that they're working with a lot of people on a regular basis that aren't comfortable with ambiguity, but they're kind of going in, they're going, you know, we're going to run a process. We can't guarantee an outcome for you, but we can guarantee a good process. But that kind of not knowing the end game thing 
um, they say they're quite comfortable with, but often the people that they work with aren't. Of course, comes with a lot of flexibility. And then there are sort of values that were mentioned, often things along kind of social justice principles of, um, you know, equity, diversity and so forth, which is to be expected. So in terms of, you know, the practitioner cohort, essentially it's a very broad church, right? It's a motley crew of people that have come from all sorts of areas <clears throat> that they've brought, you know, wide diversity of knowledge and skills through formal, informal workplace experience. Um, there's no degree programs, there's no registration requirements, and there's no core knowledge and skills. So um, I was super keen to find out, which I probably didn't have time to do justice to, as to whether the diversity of this kind of knowledge and experience puts the practice um, at an advantage or a disadvantage. You know, there's this view of, you know, is, is having people from all of these different backgrounds doing the practice in a slightly different way a good thing or a bad thing? Um, and the kind of consensus from the group was, some thought the different backgrounds were strengths. Um, others were concerned that because there was no assumed core knowledge, um, the variation in practice was too great um, in terms of people are coming at it from so many different ways. It looks so different and attempting to be so many things to so many people, it winds up being very little to not as many. Um, and quite interesting, many people held both of these views simultaneously. So they kind of talked themselves around in a circle of, I think the diversity is amazing. It's great. Oh, actually, it is a bit of a problem that the kind of we're so different in how we do it, though, because it doesn't like it's not a cohesive. Actually, no, it is a problem. So that kind of came out in sort of one sentence for a lot of people as they talk themselves around. Um, so from this kind of balancing up what they kind of thought the different types of practitioners are, and I guess I probably was a little bit sort of biased in my motivations in attending industry conferences, there's a bit of a divide amongst the practitioner set now. There's a bit of a, oh, you're the kind of infrastructure people and you're the kind of hardcore community development people. And there's a bit of a divide that's starting to emerge. Um, but I kind of, you know, opened the conversation up through those semi-structured interviews. So in terms of the different types, there's kind of three markers and it's not a matter of, you know, you're an A in this one and a B in that one, and then it gives you your type. It's not that kind of thing. A lot of these are sort of linear and they're a bit more complex, but it's just a means of highlighting the sorts of differences that exist in the group. So there was a general consensus that uh, practitioners that work inside an organisation have a different sort of role than those that work external to an organisation. So that kind of public practitioner versus the consultant practitioner. Um, the findings, <coughs> excuse me, similar to kind of some of the stuff that Oliver Escobar has found in his work, but the um, cultural change piece that needs to be taken part as part of that internal process um, was, was signified as being a quite a difficult role as opposed to the path has been cleared, the difficult conversations of whether we should be doing a process or not have already been happened. So now the consultants can kind of come in and, and find it easier to do their job. Um, the next kind of variable around practice was, and this probably speaks a little bit more to the kind of infrastructure people versus the community development people. Um, some practitioners are regularly working on processes with limited scope. So um, it's typically infrastructure in Australia. So their processes, a lot of the negotiables and the larger decisions have already been made. So they're going out and they're having a conversation about what colour would you like it as opposed to where, you know, proposing, you know, putting this massive piece of infrastructure in. So as a consequence, um, this, this conversations they're having are quite limited and there's often a higher chance of outrage in those ones because there are agendas that ministers have already signed off, funded and, and kind of so forth. Um, then there are practitioners who have the ability to work or have the kind of privilege to work on processes with a considerable scope in terms of we know we want to do something in this area, um, go out and sort of develop something, co-design it with your community and so forth. So um, there is that bit of an us and them between those two crowds, keeping in mind, you know, some, and I know from my local government experience, I got to do a bit of this and I had to do a bit of this, given the sort of business areas that the organisation covered across as well. Um, the final one, I'm going to get a bit croaky, I'm just going to grab a sip while I put this next slide up. hopefully drown the frog. Um, this one here is uh, speaks more to uh, practitioners that come in and do projects and then kind of leave versus those that are in an organisation that's always present in their communities and have ongoing programs. So, um, you know, we come in and we remove a level crossing versus um, we've been, we're in this community forever. We do different sorts of projects. We've got some that are kind of running over many years or kind of 
ongoing reference groups, larger projects and so forth. Um, it's more of a kind of project versus program approach, but very much um, dependent on the organisation and the sort of work that they do as well. So these kind of different sorts of practitioners that are emerging. I was a little bit different. I know that um, Lawrence Beher and her work, she speaks more about the political salience of, of projects and she sort of hints at the fact that some practitioners are on board with the project, whereas that wasn't as kind of evident with the Australian practitioners. They understood the need to be independent. Um, they didn't use the word neutral. They tended to prefer the word independent from different processes, which was kind of interesting. Um, so this conversation carries in a lot of the qualitative findings from the research are presented in this second paper, which was published in the Journal of Sociology. Um, late last year as well, um, but they all kind of build on each other, but focuses a little bit more on the um, the interviews that were done with those long term practitioners to really kind of pull out well what are the issues, what are the tensions. It's an interesting practice in, in my experience a lot of um, a lot of airtime that practitioners try to get in front of their organisations is really trying to build the case to do it. Like this is why we should do engagement and here's the risks it can manage and this is the conversation they're having and it often makes them a little bit hesitant to be more critical of what they do, how they do it, how they could have improved it. It's more of a, we're so busy trying to get people to do it, we don't want to point out anything that's wrong with it. So I was trying to, you know, pull out what some of those tensions are that they experience. Um, so it draws heavily on the questions of what's making it difficult or more challenging to deliver good engagement. Um, what are the tensions or dilemmas that you face in your work and how do you manage them? So the major themes were very much um, the kind of employment, the employer versus the community, this kind of earnest desire to get deliver meaningful engagement um, and also trying to kind of appear relatively neutral at it as well, um, kind of speaks to the sort of cat picture from earlier, I guess. This idea, um, and I, I quite like this one, this quote is sums it up really nicely. You know, on one hand, you want to do best by the community, but occasionally there's this niggling voice at the back of your head telling you not to upset your employer and to toe the line. So, um, you know, a lot of practitioners are being paid by the organisation. They're not being paid by, you know, independent not-for-profits. They're not being paid by their community. Um, so it's kind of conscious that that's the, the balance they're always trying to make. Um, there is a perception that they're always working for the other side, whichever side they're kind of working for. Um, so uh, organisations think that they're working against the project, you're slowing us down, we're not going to get our thing built or, or whatever at the end. Um, and meanwhile, communities are like, you know, you're, you're just here to kind of represent the organisation. So they often speak about this kind of double agent role that they feel that they're playing as they're kind of, you know, advocating for one and letting the other in and, and kind of vice versa, which um, speaks to that interesting conundrum of how this practice is and how the practitioners are placed between um, kind of two masters, I guess. Um, the issue of independence or neutrality is quite interesting. As I said before, they tended not to use the word neutral because most of them are paid by or employed inside organisations. They like the word independent though. Um, so, I, you know, my question in a lot of cases was, well, who, who are we seeking to appear independent from? Um, Independence from the subject matter was important to most of them. Um, independence from the organisation was also important to most of those that were interviewed. Independence from the community was important to some of them, but not so much for others. They saw themselves more as a kind of community advocate role. Um, so this constant sort of issue of, am I, am I here to protect the process? Am I here to protect the outcome? Am I here to protect the organisation? Am I here to advocate for the community? Those different sorts of roles in terms of how they make decisions, how they they plan their processes, there wasn't a, a kind of consensus as to what was more important. Um, so that was a big one. The other one was um, whether they are a kind of, you know, a, a, they're balancing this sort of need to make a money and pay their mortgage and, and run a successful business or, or what have you on one side, plus this kind of issue of, you know, running a really democratically robust kind of process. Um, I think it's pretty nuanced. I think there's a, a quite a wide variation of practice. It depends on a lot of things in terms of how they're perceived, um, whether that's internal or external, who their employer is, who their communities are, how they're perceived between each other and, and all the rest of it, and also how they position themselves. Um, you know, organisations where engagement has a really big focus, they it's easier to do their work. Um, organisations where they're the first person to be doing any engagement role, they're kind of sort of chipping away at getting people to understand what the role is, let alone kind of doing amazing stuff. So um, it's a pretty bit of a sort of tricky balance. And I think I just suspect some might be mastering it a little bit better than others. Um, the issue of public and private 
you know, practitioners came back up again, um, mirroring some of the work that's been done overseas. So, you know, public practitioners talked a lot about the internal barriers, the resistance from other staff, like, oh, I've told that I've got to talk to you. They want us to do engagement on our project and I can't believe I've got to do this. Um, so other staff resistance from senior management, from executives and from decision makers, uh, particularly a couple of really interesting stories about not so much decision makers, but more uh, senior executives that work as the gatekeepers to decision makers to try and control the process a little bit in terms of, oh, the minister won't like that. Can we take that out? Is more about, well, that's what the community said. So no, we can't. So those kinds of uh, issues that they come up against. Interestingly, concerns about job security came up quite a bit, which I hadn't seen in the overseas literature. There's a bit of a uh, kind of vibe from some of the senior public practitioners of if I push too hard against that's not legitimate, that's not very transparent, I don't think that's terribly fair. If they, if they argue that case, they're worried given the kind of climate, and this was sort of pre-COVID, it might be a little bit more exacerbated now. This kind of idea that um, if I speak up at the wrong time, like sometimes I can do it, I can pick my battles, but if I pick the wrong time, they might just find somebody who's easier to work with, which probably means more agreeable to the organisation or more agreeable to the outcome, which is a bit concerning. Um, private practitioners were of course a little bit more concerned in their responses, protecting probably their kind of commercial IP and so forth, but a concern that, um, you know, are they going to pay me for coming up with the wrong answer? Um, I heard variations of that kind of a, a few few times. Um, and of course, as I mentioned before, the perception was the practice was a bit easier because the path had kind of been cleared before and that they did have a degree of kind of arm's length from the organisation, um, which allowed them to be a little bit more neutral or independent, they thought as well. Um, interestingly, uh, the grass was not greener on the other side for either type of practitioner. Public practitioners were like, oh, there's no way I'd want to work in consultancy. And, as, and, and consultants were like, oh, there's no way I'd want to work in the public sector. So they kind of saw each other's roles as more difficult, um, which I thought was kind of interesting. The other kinds of tensions that they experience are essentially all centered around the nature of public institutions and there's you know kind of eight of them that I kind of step through so you know I feel I feel tensions I feel it's challenging you know when the community actually is probably right but I have to toe the toe the line of my organization um, you know I've experienced tensions when when we kind of lack authority or more kind of autonomy like you know I I a person's got a question, I'm in a community forum, I think I know the answer. I'm not sure if I have permission or authority to give that answer yet. So that kind of internal politics that uh, practitioners feel hinder their ability to be transparent um, and other kinds of, you know, values that uh, that they think are really important to the practice. Uh, they struggle when the engagement is tokenistic. Um, and there's, a, there's kind of two camps on this. Some of them, you know, I, if I think that it's not legitimate 100%, then I, I won't do that work, which is obviously easier if you're a private practitioner. Um, others go, oh, look, occasionally we have to do those ones that are a little bit tokenistic. And sometimes, you know, they're tokenistic because the legislation is really terribly written. Um, you know, the, the legislation says go and consult people on what kind of increase they want in their water pricing. Like it's just, you know, you already know the answer is none thanks. So some of the processes that they're expected to do some of them really struggle with that work and others are kind of willing to accept a little bit and some I don't think maybe know any different. Um, when the bureaucracy and decision makers aren't aligned, it refers to a uh, really enthusiastic staff member of a public institution. We really want to do this amazing process. They bring the consultant in, they set everything up. Um, the consultant then speaks with the decision maker and it turns out the decision makers already know what they want to do and to run a process would be a waste. So that kind of uh, gap that you see, whether things get lost as they go up or down the food chain can be problematic as well. Um, when decision makers are not fully committed to or understanding of the process, you know, when a, a local council tells us to go out and engage and report back next month, they don't understand that we need to put things in people's diaries and send out information and, and a kind of coming back within a month is not really feasible or understanding that you might get this as an answer or you might get this as an outcome, which means that you might need to be willing to accept it. Um, senior public servants and political advisors interference I spoke about a little bit before and this kind of this eagerness to manage risk that comes out of engaging community this conversation about risk being more important than kind of um, democracy is really interesting and I've got a whole nother PhD I'll do at some point on that stuff um, 
the institutions and their balance of expert views is really interesting, particularly uh, the people I spoke to that worked in more kind of science and environmental type organisations. There is still ongoing conversations of how do we balance community views with kind of expert views. Um, and it just goes around and around in circles according to them. Um, and of course, a lot of private consultants were found it difficult when they would do amazing engagement processes, bring the community along, come up with these amazing outcomes, and then the organisation would go, thank you very much. And then they would sit on it for sometimes years and the decision itself for the recommendations were never adopted or actioned. So, um, you know, we've gone out there, we've done lots of really fabulous stuff and then you failed to follow up on any of it. They find quite frustrating as well. So of course, all of this, all of these frustrations, you know, whether it's the institution or their kind of dual role that they're playing and so forth, the question is, well, how do you manage it? What do you do when you experience those tensions? Um, and keeping in mind, these are, ser these are experienced practitioners. They've all got over 10 years. Um, and their, their mix of strategies were basically threefold. The number one strategy was essentially avoidance. So, and this was very common with private practitioners. If I'm working with somebody and I think, oh, I don't think you quite get it. I think this is gonna be really difficult. Um, I'm sorry, I'm just really busy next month or oh, I don't have time to do that. They just make themselves unavailable or try and cost themselves out, um, which is interesting. The second strategy, if that, you know, if that's not available or that's not open to them, I think in the paper I call it prevention, but it's more kind of preparation. So it's a lot of kind of capacity building with the organisation and the decision maker to get them ready for what might happen um, and what they might do so that the sort of knee jerk reactions and sorts of, you know, caving to pressure and decision making don't kind of kick in. And of course, if that's not successful or it doesn't quite work, the sort of third and final strategy tends to be that, well, you know, if we've avoided it or if we've really done our best to get everybody ready with what to expect and, and kind of uh, get them ready, if that doesn't work, then it really is about having difficult conversations to kind of um, get people, you know, on board with what it is that's happening, how we might deal with it and to kind of coach them through that. So, of course, different for sorts of public practitioners and private practitioners as they're sort of managing the interests of, I would like to work for your organisation again because you pay really well, but, you know, I'm also struggling with the fact that, you know, if you do this at this point, you've just ruined a whole lot of good work and, and maybe kind of lost a bit of trust with our community or whatever. Um, but it does tend, to, it, it's quite interesting their approaches because, the, the thing that I kind of learned as I was doing these interviews was that it was very dependent on their position. So these were experienced practitioners. Um, so they spoke a lot about, I know what battles to have and when, like I didn't earlier on, but I, I know now because I've got quite a bit of experience. Um, it also kind of tended to correlate with confidence quite a bit. I'm, you know, I, I feel confident in having these arguments. I know how to have them. I've done it before. Um, position in the hierarchy was really important. So they acknowledge the fact that, look, when I was a kind of, you know, band five junior officer inside my organisation and I saw something that I thought, oh, this isn't very good practice, um, I, you know, I'd tell my boss, you know, and nothing would kind of happen. Whereas now that I'm kind of at a manager or executive level, um, I feel, you know, I, I sit higher in the food chain. My voice is kind of um, heard a bit more. Interestingly as well, and I've kind of experienced this, if you're inside the organisation and you sort of say to the organisation, I don't think this is very good practice, um, you can be more easily ignored than if you pay a consultant to come in and say the exact same thing as well. So, you know, if you're paying for the opinion, it's worth more than, it, than if somebody from inside the organisation is saying it as well, um, which is quite widely acknowledged. The relationship with senior leaders and decision makers is also quite important. If there is a kind of mutual respect there, um, the ability to sort of have difficult conversations um, and improve practice is uh, often Often better than if you're seen as a troublemaker or you don't have those relationships or if you're kind of new to an organisation. Um, and of course, the organisational understanding and profile of community engagement. So um, in some organisations, people don't really know what it is. They think it's public relations or they think it's communications or, or what have you that can often impact their ability to enter into kind of higher level, more strategic conversations about what should be happening from a um, practice point of view. So it's very dependent. You know, if, you're, if you've been around the block a few times, you've played it on both sides of the fence, you know all the things that can and do go wrong. Um, you're quite well known. You've got good relationships, then you're more likely to find it easy to do better practice than if you're a junior officer that hasn't been very well mentored that may have come from a different background and going, oh, actually, I think this is, you know, not very good practice. Um, and of course, one of the, the um, 
the bits that not all of the senior practitioners, but quite a lot of them spoke about was how they use principles or how they use values. So <clears throat> in making those difficult um, discussions, having those entering to those difficult conversations to say, actually, if you do this, I think it risks the project. They referred a lot to their principles as their guide for decision making. So, um, you know, and, I, and they gave examples like, um, it's really important to me <clears throat> that we are inclusive in everything that we do. So if they're proposing, you know, not engaging with groups X, Y, and Z, then, then because that doesn't sit with my values of being inclusive of participation, that, that's when I speak up. So they use that as their guide for um, whether to do something or not do something or argue for something or advocate for something within process, um, which kind of, you know, alerts me to that issue of, well, what are, what are inexperienced practitioners doing? Um, they don't have the kind of theory, they don't have the background, they don't have good mentors, um, you know, and they're being asked to do good practice, bad practice does, you know, by their organisations, what do they do in those kind of situations, which, um, who knows. Um, so I probably haven't answered all of the questions. I've probably just gathered more information and gone off in a few kinds of tangents, um, which is very much my style of research, unfortunately. But um, it's also, I, I think my contribution is probably a starting point in that there's not a lot out there and it's often a kind of overlooked group of practitioners and kind of linchpin important actually in, in the kind of uh, implementation of engagement processes, deliberative processes, participation processes and so forth. So um, I have done everything I need to do, which has left us lovely 15 minutes for any kind of questions or discussion. Fantastic. Um, sorry, Thank you for the claps. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's really good. Thank you.